Welcome to CFA Online. We're glad that you've joined with us today. If you are new to our broadcast, we invite you to comment below. Uh, you can also check out our webpage, cfachurch.ca. Find out more about us and our church. And you can also uh, fill out one of our connection forms there as we would love to connect with you. There's just a few things we want you to be aware of this week. First, we pass along condolences to the Van Haga family, to Brenda and all of the family at the passing of Jan Van Haga this past week, who died of uh, complications to COVID. Secondly, we want to send along uh, a big thank you to all of our church family who um, this past Christmas have given us cards, uh, gifts, food, uh, and money, uh, monetary donations that have come our way this Christmas. We are so blessed as a staff and we appreciate every uh, encouragement, every word, uh, and every gift that has been given to us this Christmas season. It makes our job uh, serving you and ministering to you such a blessing uh, when we see the, the gratitude and the thankfulness poured out back to us um, from you. And so thank you so much for all that you've done for us and for our families. Uh, thirdly, we want you to make you aware of our baptismal service that we are going to be doing on January 31st uh, here at the church. If you are interested in being baptized or are interested in learning more about baptism and why we do baptism and what it is, uh, you can sign up for our baptism class that will be taking place the Sunday before on January 24th here at CFA at 11 o'clock. Uh, you can register for that online at our church center app, or you can call the church office and register through there. We invite you to worship with us as we celebrate God uh, and look into his word as Pastor Glenn comes a little bit later with the message. Welcome to church. Who breaks power? Sin and darkness, whose love is mighty and so much stronger. The King of glory, the King above all kings. Who shakes the whole earth with holy thunder, who leaves us breathless in awe and wonder. The King of glory, the King above all kings. This is amazing grace This is unfailing love That you would take my place That you would bear my cross You would lay down your life That I would be set free Whoa, Jesus I sing for all that you've done for me Who brings the chaos back into order Who makes the orphan a son and daughter The king of glory, the king above all kings Shines like the sun in all of its brilliance The King of glory, the King above all kings This is amazing grace This is unfailing love That you would take my place That you would bear my cross You would lay down your life that I would be set free Whoa, Jesus, I sing for All that you've done for me Worthy is the Lamb who was slain Worthy is the King who conquered the grave. Worthy is 
the lamb who was slain Worthy is the king who conquered the grave Worthy is the lamb who was slain Worthy is the king who conquered the grave Worthy is the lamb who was slain Because of your great love You lived, you died You said in three days you would rise You did, you're alive You rule, you reign You said you're coming back again I know you will, all the earth will sing your praises. All the earth will sing your praises. You took, you take your sins away, oh God. You give. Gave your life away for us. You came down, you saved us through the cross. Our hearts are changed because of your great love. You lived, you died, you said in three days you would rise. You did. You're alive. You rule, you reign. You said you're coming back again. I know you will. All the earth will sing your praises. All the earth will sing your praises. said in three days you would rise you did you're alive you rule you reign you said you're coming back again i know you will all the earth will sing your praises praises all the earth will sing your praises I can 
cast my mind to Calvary, where Jesus bled and died for me. I see his wounds, his hands, his feet, my Savior.
Good morning. We're going to take this opportunity to celebrate communion together. Uh, communion is this uh, rite, this ritual, this, this habit we do as followers of Jesus that signifies a remembrance of what Jesus did for us, that he gave up his life on the cross and rose to new life, that in him, by our faith in him, we have died to sin and now through Jesus have new life with God.
but it's also a remembrance of the fact that Jesus is coming back and that there's going to be a point in time where he returns and wraps up all things and, and we look forward with hope to that complete fulfillment of Jesus' promises. And yet communion is also for the present day, this present moment, a reminder to us, an act that we do to remind us, uh, an interruption even to the normal rhythm of our life, to remind us that as followers of Jesus, we are citizens of the kingdom of God right now in how we live in this world, in what we do with our lives, in how we are bonded together as uh, the body of Christ, as the church, as followers of Jesus, children of God, in the family of God. And so when we celebrate communion together, it, we're, we're pausing, we're stopping to remember who Jesus is, what he's done, what he's yet to do, and that he is alive right now through us as the church. And so it's this act of, of family, this act of unity that we are celebrating together when we take communion. And so for right now, I want to invite you, uh, if you're watching from home, just to pause and take a moment to go collect uh, the elements for communion, the bread and the cup, whatever you might be using uh, for that purpose. Um, at the end of the day, it really doesn't matter what it is, is it's this act that uh, even if you're at home, you're not with us in person here in the church, yet in spirit, we are doing this together uh, in recognition that we're the church, the body of Christ. So go ahead and pause and you can go collect the elements for communion. So the Apostle Paul writes in 1 Corinthians chapter 11, that I received from the Lord what I also passed on to you. The Lord Jesus, on the night he was betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, this is my body which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, after supper, he took the cup, saying, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. Father in heaven, thank you that you are our Lord, that you are God, that you are Father, and that for anyone who professes faith in you, for anyone, no matter what their lives look like right now, no matter what they've done, no matter whether they've grown up in the church or not, whatever, their lives might be, that anyone who turns their eyes to you right now, who is pursuing you right now, that they are followers of Jesus, children of God. And thank you that we are one body together. We're one family in spite of differences, in spite of different cultures and ages and, and just even times and uh, that we've lived throughout world history. We are part of this one church. And thank you that because of you, because of the blood of Jesus, we're not only welcomed into your family, but we're just invited into this relationship with one another as your children, that we can love and support one another no matter the times. And so I ask that you would continue to do that, to bond us together as the body of Christ. And we pray all of this in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, good morning and Happy New Year to all of you. I just want to echo Pastor Steve's thank you for all of the wonderful, kind gestures uh, that you directed to us. It's very humbling and we, we appreciate it very much. Sitting on an upside down five gallon pail, looking down a 10 inch hole through about 12 inches of ice, watching for fish all day inside of a little black tent is my idea of the Holy of Holies. It's a place where I experience the presence of God. It's a wonderful silence, soothing, uh, punctuated by an occasional thunderous pressure crack of lake ice. Um, time seems to stand still. Uh, 
And then suddenly the light is dwindling and is gone, just like the last nine hours. And the benefit of times and places like that for me is the, the opportunity for reflection and for meditation. Uh, and it's not just the quiet of the environment, but there's a quiet that comes to the soul as well. I was totally content there. And it was about the third day that I was ice fishing when I found myself thinking intently about the year that had been and what the year to come might be like. I'm unsure of whether we're at the beginning of something new or completely that'll never go back or if we're in the middle of something or near the end. Um, I had been reminiscing about how we got blindsided by the COVID. Um, I laughed right out loud in, the, in my tent uh, at, at the way we christened 2020 to be this phenomenal year of spiritual insight, 2020 spiritual vision, and uh, how eloquent and spiritual and leadershipy uh, we were as we prophesied that 2020 would be the year of spiritual clarity. And I say that that was probably more wishful thinking than spiritual insight. At best, it was a prayer, but at worst, it was probably an entitled presumption. Um, and I also chuckled at the fact that no one saw it coming. No one. Uh, except those who told us that they did after it had all come. And then they said, yeah, yeah, we knew that was going to happen. Mm -hmm. um, and then when Pastor Steve mentioned it in his excellent message last week, I found myself laughing out loud again. And, and uh, in some ways just kind of rolled my eyes. How embarrassing. I was reminded of a Star Wars dialogue clip where Yoda says, blind are we if creation of 2020 we could not see. And Mace Windu says, I think it's time we inform the Senate that our ability to use the, and I would put in the word spirit, uh, has diminished. Um, why didn't the church see it coming at all? I think it falls into the category, though, of accidental prophecy, very much like John 11. Uh, in John 11, Caiaphas is the high priest uh, that year, and he says to them as they're deliberating about what to do with Jesus, you all know nothing at all, nor do you take into account that it is expedient for you that one man die for the people and that the whole nation not perish. Now, that turns out to be extremely accurate. It's exactly what Jesus did. But it is not at all what Caiaphas meant and what he thought would happen. So, to me, 2020 is also relevant uh, to Matthew 7 uh, and the parable where Jesus talks about the two houses, one built on uh, the good foundation and one built on the sand. Of note in that parable in Matthew 7 is that the house looked just fine. And it doesn't say that there was any faulty workmanship in the way the house was constructed, but it says that when the storm hit, that was when you knew whether there was a fatal structural flaw or not. The storm reveals everything, not the sunny day. And it's a report card on how well your house is conceived and built. And I think that there's a spiritual lesson in this for us too. One more verse that comes to mind is this, uh, considering the wind and the time of testing. Hebrews 12, 27, it says, yet once more denotes the removing of things which can be shaken as of created things, so that those things which cannot be shaken may remain. Verse 28 is beautiful. Therefore, since we receive a kingdom which cannot be shaken, let us show gratitude by which we may offer to God an acceptable service with reverence and awe. So, that phrase, the things which remain, becomes important as we go through our conversation today. I played a song for you a while back ago as well. It was, uh, I can see clearly now the rain is gone. I can see all obstacles in my way. 
I think that we were moving along without the awareness of all the obstacles that were really present. 2020 didn't do anything really to fundamentally change. What it did was it peeled back layers and exposed things that are there in culture and society. 2020 is the wind that comes against the house built on the rock or the sand. And I think whether we'd like to admit it or not, we have been weighed and measured. And I think we do see more clearly. The problem is we don't really like what we see. 1 Corinthians 3 reminds us that every man's work will be tested and it will become evident for the day will show it because it is to be revealed with fire and the fire itself will test the quality of each man's work. So this time of testing, oh, sorry, verse 14, if any man work, if any man's work, which he has built on it remains, he will receive a reward. And so the time of testing can strip away that which is peripheral and leave you with the essence of something. So what do we see then? Uh, uh, what have we built? Cole's notes version for me is we can see how fragile our world is, is the first thing. How quickly it can all become unglued. Look back to the shocking riots of this past week when in a free democracy, the world's superpower with all of its democratic free society capitalism and, and its, its uh, claim of being the best country in the world, the place came apart. People, its citizens, took over the legislature. Uh, that's unheard of. We're seeing cracks uh, and things coming apart at the seams, political and racial polarization, regional, national, international economies proved to be very fragile and were easily derailed. How quickly people are losing their faith in all of these idols that we have counted on, our governments, our economies, our political systems, our justice systems, and all of these things are being shaken and being exposed. Oh, freedom, even freedom is a word, it, it sounds so noble and it is, it is exalted, but freedom itself is only, can only be entrusted to the mature and to the moral. Uh, the freedom, the idea that you can go anywhere you want and do anything you want uh, is not what freedom is for. And that's why we don't give freedom to our children. Uh, we, we give them freedom incrementally as they show the maturity to be able to handle it. And so, so we, see, we see a world and we see communities being fragmented more and more. And in spite of all of our personal mobility and our magical uh, technology and machines, people are more connected than ever and more depressed and more isolated than ever. We have seen how impotent governments and rhetoric are. And even in the church, the people that once streamed through these doors uh, have been cut in half or more. When uh, the squeeze gets tighter, it forces what's on the inside of us to the outside. And I'm not sure it has all been Jesus that the church has exhibited. In fact, I know, uh, I know it isn't all Jesus. So in pondering the year, of revelation of 2020 vision and wondering at my part in it all. Um, I have been going to sleep praying about my part and of what God wants from me and for all of us in 2021 and asking God what now. So as I did that the other night, I woke up very early, about four o'clock in the morning, which is highly unusual for me. And it wasn't because I had to go to the bathroom. It was I had a word. There was a word. And by word, I mean a single word. There was one word in my mind, and it was the word Titus, the name Titus. Of course, we know that's a small pastoral letter near the end of the Bible. And uh, no specific verses came to mind. I pondered different verses that I knew were in Titus, and there was nothing particularly relevant, I, I would say, uh, uh, about anything, nothing that was jumping off, off of the page. And, and the more curious I got, the more awake I became. And so I finally gave up trying to sleep and I went down and lit a fire and sat in my chair and I began to read through the book of Titus. And I read it through multiple times. 
It didn't take long, but I was asking, Lord, what are you telling me? What are you trying to show me through the book of Titus? And the whole thing is only 46 verses. And so who was Paul writing to in Titus? Um, we learn that it's a, it's a young protege of his, probably not too young. He's certainly mature in the Lord because uh, Paul calls him a true child in the faith that they share in Jesus. And he is a leader that Paul is installing on the island of Crete in charge over the churches that are there. And, and he has a specific apostolic mandate from Paul. So Paul calls him a true child. And that's important in his letter because that endorses Titus as the apostolic designate uh, to be able to carry out his ministry in the name of, of Paul and of Jesus. But it, it cuts both ways because it also reminds Titus that he is there and in charge with a specific ministry and mission in, in Paul's mind to fulfill it. And, and we find that mission in chapter 1, verse 5 of Titus. He says, For this reason I left you in Crete, Titus, that you would set in order what remains. And there's that phrase again, the, uh, set in order what remains. And those words resonated with me as I read that assignment. And then he goes on to say, and to appoint elders in every city as I directed you. Uh, again, that verse from Hebrews that what can be shaken will, but what remains is unshakable. And there's uh, also, as I read through this passage, uh, over and over, there's this jackhammer phrase uh, repeated over and over, words. And, and it, nine times in 46 verses, we find this word deeds and often good deeds. Uh, so Titus 1, 6, they profess to know God, but by their deeds, they deny him being detestable, disobedient, worthless for any good deed. Uh, 2, 6, and 7. Likewise, I urge young men to be sensible and all things show yourself to be an example of good deeds with uh, purity in doctrine and be dignified. Titus 2, 14. Uh, speaking about Jesus who gave himself for us to redeem us from every lawless deed and to purif purify himself uh, for himself, a people for his own possession, zealous for good deeds. Titus 3.1, remind them to be subject to rulers, to authorities, to be obedient, to be ready for every good deed. Titus 3.5, he saved us not on the basis of deeds which we have done in righteousness, but according to his mercy, by the washing of regeneration and the renewing of the spirit. That's very important, that idea. Titus 3.8, this is trustworthy statement and concerning these things, I want you to speak confidently so that those who have believed in God will be careful to engage in good deeds. These things are good and profitable uh, for men. And finally, verse 14 of chapter 3, our people must learn to engage in good deeds to meet pressing needs so that they will not be unfruitful. And so we see this Powerful repetition about deeds. Now, for a church that has a very clear theology and biblical understanding of a doctrine called grace, that by grace we have been saved, that it's the mercy of God towards sinners, that it's not of ourselves, it's the gift of God, the salvation by faith in Jesus Christ alone. This is an interesting emphasis to talk about good deeds. So why is Paul so adamant here about this? And more specifically, why is that and how is that important to us? Why did God send me to Titus? And what should we talk about? So, Upon this examination, we realize that not all deeds are created equal. There were some that were detestable and some that were good. We are encouraged to do some and told others are worthless. Well, I think we gain an understanding when we understanding, uh, understand who Paul is writing to and what this ministry dynamic was going to be like for Titus. Crete is one of the main islands in the in Grecian Mediterranean. It's about 250 kilometers long east to west and ranges between 12 and 60 kilometers deep or, or wide north to south. Uh, it is 600 kilometers south of Philippi. And if you go up and to the left a little bit on the main line, again, is Corinth. And up and to the right a little bit is Ephesus. Very important centers, all very important. The thing is that the island of Crete is sitting right where all of those 
nations and ports empty into the Mediterranean. And so uh, basically Crete is on the way to everywhere you're going. And because of that, it has a tremendously transient culture and it has people coming and going and people in cultures and in, in situations like this uh, often take advantage of the anonymity of stopping in a foreign port where nobody knows them. And Crete was known to be willing to provide for you anything you wanted. The culture was known for its indulgence and for its greed and even gluttony. Uh, the Eagles wrote a song called Life in the Fast Lane. And one of the lines is everything all the time. That song could have been the anthem for the Isle of Crete. The Cretans were known for their warring as well, for their divisions and constant bickering and fighting and cities going to war against one another. They were always fighting, always in rebellion. There was always civil strife. And that wasn't just true of the regions. That was true between the people. It was a very confrontational culture. And so fond of altercation were they and of fighting that they monetized it. They sold themselves as mercenaries into armies. And, and it, on the seas, which was the lifeblood, they engaged in piracy and, and would hijack the goods uh, that were coming and being traded. Their secular culture was infamous for lying, for greed, and for thieving. And their religious syncretism mashed together all kinds of truths and elements of from ritual to, to cultic uh, and even now Christianity. And that all got mashed together uh, in some kind of an abomination of religious uh, thought. Now, I, I want to be honest, I, I really didn't know all of that about Crete. And if I had ever learned that about Titus and Crete and that, it's been so long that I've thought about it that I had forgotten. But I couldn't help but realize how much this reflects the culture that you and I are living in and the world we're living in right now. Legalized uh, drug use, normalized sinful lifestyles, uh, not only taught, but promoted, uh, truth under attack, culture invading the church and wreaking havoc on people. The, the legislation that doesn't allow us to preach all of the gospel that won't allow us to help people who ask us for help with certain issues, uh, is being legislated against. It'll become a crime. Rampant and reckless individualism in our culture in our lifestyles and the factions and divisions that have appeared around and through COVID that have been exposed by it, um, both inside and outside of the church have been dramatic. It's not surprising to read the qualifications for elders that uh, Paul gives to Titus. He says, I want you to put people like this in. And the list of qualifications for elders that we find in chapter one of Titus is really the exact opposite of everything Cretan culture and Cretan people were known for. The, the qualifications are, if any man is above reproach, well, this is a very deceptive, lying culture. Um, the husband of one wife having children who believe, not accused of dissipation, uh, of divisions or rebellion. Uh, well, that wasn't Christian culture. For the overseer must be above reproach as God's stewards. That was not normal in Crete. Not self-willed, not quick-tempered, not addicted to wine, not pugnacious, which means quarrelsome, uh, not fond of sordid gain. Again, all things completely contrary to normal Christian living and rules. Uh, verse 8, it says, but they should be hospitable, loving what is good, sensible, just, devout, uh, and self-controlled. Again, not what Crete was known for. And people who were saved from the culture of Crete, in the culture of Crete, uh, would have had a lot of hurdles to overcome to learn how to walk in Christ. And it says they must uh, hold fast to the faithful word, which is in accordance with the teaching, so that he will be able to both exhort in sound doctrine and refute those who contradict. This was the task that would be in front of them always in this culture in Crete. And I'm reminded again of, of what Paul says to Titus, set in order what remains, which tells me that in the church there was tremendous disorder. And 
and all kinds of troubles. So in order to understand what was going on in the church, we can keep reading in the text beginning in verse 10. For there are many rebellious men, empty talkers and deceivers, especially those of the circumcision. Now we're getting idea of some, what some of the ritual uh, uh, was. Uh, who must be silenced because they are upsetting whole families. Households were in turmoil. People were in confusion. And there are people teaching things they should not teach for the sake of sordid gain. Well, what's that all about? Well, teachers would often be recipients of gifts or support so they could give themselves to, to the teaching ministry. And so they were doing it to get the money and they were being deceptive in in. They were not sincere in the gospel. Uh, they just wanted the money. And they were teaching lies. And they knew it. It says that they were not only empty talkers, but deceivers. It wasn't just that what they were saying didn't have value. It was that it was wrong. And it was creating all kinds of discord. And then Paul says this, of themselves, a prophet of their own. So your own people of Crete say this about themselves. Cretans are always liars, evil beasts, and lazy gluttons. Well, you can hear about all those things we just described uh, in the culture. And then Paul says this shocking statement, this testimony is true. <laughs> that's, that's what the culture of Crete is like. And for this reason, reprove them severely so that they may be sound in the faith. Now, there's a clue here about what he's talking about. He's not talking about Crete's culture in general. He said, I want you to rebuke them so that they can be sound in their faith. This is in the church. This is in the churches of Crete. And it says in verse 14, not paying attention to Jewish myths. Again, there's that clue again about what the ritual was or the commandments of men. The, the gospel had become corrupted with the teachings and thoughts and ideas and rationale of men who turn away from the truth. And we're reminded of Romans 1, who it says that people of depraved mind deny God and God gives them over to, to that mind. So as bad as Crete is, as a nation, as, as an island, it's not a nation. The real problem is the prevailing culture has infiltrated and is now threatening the church. So Paul hopes that these people can be turned around. But this church is caught between, between religious ritual and re religious ceremonial cleansing, which was now obsolete in Christ, and a very carnal culture, a very fleshly culture. And it has... The, the culture has invaded and established a foothold in the church. But what about the good deeds that Paul's talking about seems like endlessly in this letter? Well, Paul begins evaluating the, the problems, which we've now heard all about, uh, which are confronting Titus and the body. But he also has a gospel solution as well. And there is hope for this church and there's hope for us and there's hope for anybody in any culture if we will accept the gospel uh, that Paul is preaching and teaching. Paul diagnoses this whole thing in verses 15 and 16 as an inner issue. The problem is in the heart. So he says, to the pure, all things are pure. But to those who are defiled and unbelieving, nothing is pure. But their deeds, uh, oh, sorry, But to those who are defiled and unbelieving, nothing is pure, but both their mind and their conscience are defiled. They profess to know God, but by their deeds, they deny him. And that's a striking statement. How many people profess to know God, but by their deeds, by their character, by their attitude, they deny the very thing. And, and it says, that they are detestable and disobedient and worthless for any good deed. Nothing they do will have any spiritual value. Well, when Paul talks about the pure here, he's not talking about perfect people because we know there are none of them. Uh, even he himself said, said, I see sin at work in me in Romans 7. And so he's not talking about the perfect. So what are the pure? The pure are, are those who are pure because of the work of Christ and are not those who are pure because they are performing ritual cleansing uh, in Jewish tradition or, or even in the cults. And so he is talking about the pure as being those whose hearts have been truly transformed by the work of Christ. 
The true life, the recreated, the regenerated life of Christ in the true believer. Jesus has this debate about what it is that defiles us with the Pharisees himself. In Mark chapter 7, he talks about how it's not what goes into the man. What goes into the man is, goes into the stomach and is eliminated. He says later on in the passage, don't you understand that it's what comes out of the man that defiles him? It's what comes out of our heart. So once again, we think back to the storm and the wind blowing on the house, uh, the storms that put pressure on us. What is it that comes out of us? when we are put under pressure, when we're put and tried in the fire of the testing furnace. For he says, out of the heart of man proceed evil thoughts, fornications, thefts, murders, adulteries, deeds of coveting and wickedness, as well as deceit, sensuality, envy, slander, pride, foolishness. All these things proceed from within. That's what defiles the man. That was what Jesus taught us. And Paul echoed those sentiments exactly. Paul would talk about this and teach about this often in his epistles. And so here is, he is delivering the gospel and the reality for the church of Crete and to these false teachers. There's only one way that good deeds can flow from you. And that is that you be truly transformed. And when you are truly transformed by Christ, you will deny and walk away from all of those deeply entrenched cultural behaviors and norms and patterns. And, and you will no longer be a liar. You will no longer be deceptive. You'll no longer be fond of sordid gain. You'll no longer be divisive. You'll no longer have that, that, uh, cantankerous, pugnacious attitude, but there will be something of the peace of God and the, the, the fragrance of Christ will begin to permeate your life. And, and those were the people that Paul said he wanted Titus to put in charge of and to teach that Christ life uh, in the church. For someone in a compromising culture, and I would say ours is the same, uh, that the gospel of Christ can come under attack even once we've started to build this life of, of Christ. And, and if the gospel in us is tainted and if the world is beginning to slip in and seep in and, and create compromise in us, then all we do will be tainted. Uh, if, if our hearts uh, begin to be informed by secular culture and secular thinking, then our spiritual fruit will be tainted. If we begin to move into self-made religion or self-seeking motives, it'll be tainted. If it comes from uh, ritual religion or religious behaviors, it'll be tainted. If it comes from deception or manipulation or compromise, a compromised mind and heart, our fruit and our deeds will be tainted. Underlying the whole of Paul's cure for Crete is the assumption that Christian conduct is rooted in the acceptance of the apostolic faith. That through the Spirit, the mind is, to the mind is revealed by the Spirit, and, and, and our mind apprehends and endorses and organizes truth into a framework of holy living, of what God says is good. And then, by a, a now Christ rejuvenated spirit empowered conscience. We are empowered to choose the right moral decision. And so rejecting or adding to these truths or amalgamating them with other religions and other thought, the thoughts of men, the philosophies of men, the ideas of men will pervert our truth foundation. And that will in turn cause a dysfunction in our conscience. And we will then make decisions that fall short of the things that God has called us and will not bear supernatural fruit. In fact, Paul described what these false teachers, uh, their deeds as being detestable, disobedient, and worthless. And so, Paul is not advocating here a works-based salvation. He's simply advocating for a truly transformed heart and that from the transformed heart comes a transformed mind and the transformed conscience which produces good deeds. And this, of course, this formula works backwards too, that if you want to know 
who the true believers are, you can see by their good deeds. Jesus said, you'll know them by their fruit. So it, it works both ways because it's a total package deal. It's all or nothing. And so what is the word to us? What is, what is the word of Titus all about? Well, I would say that in the light of 2020, uh, or 2020, the, the year, uh, it has wrung us out and it's exposed us as a people uh, of God. And to me, it says, We've been shaken. What can be shaken is being shaken. But strengthen what remains. Rebuild your foundations if you have to. Find a way to make sure that you have not compromised uh, and that you're not compromising with the prevailing culture of Crete or of Canada. And don't allow these things to invade and, and undermine your foundation. There's a long-term response that has to do with the Bible. If we don't have biblical truth, we won't be able to bring every thought captive, is what the scripture says in 2 Corinthians 10. And, and so we have to, through the word of God, enter a lifelong process of, of filling our hearts and minds with the truth of God's word so that we can recognize and identify what is of him and what is not. And that will inform our conscience and that will indeed in turn produce the, the work in keeping with repentance. But that's a lifelong thing that we'll enter into. I have a short-term um, house inspection for you. Houses are inspected according to building codes, and building codes are established to make sure that the houses are safe and that they stand. There is a building code that we can read in the book of Galatians, but we need to read it with the help of the Spirit. So pray with me, Psalm 139. Search me, O God, and know my heart. Try me and know my anxious thoughts. And see if there is any hurtful way in me. And lead me in the way everlasting. Amen. That's a prayer we have to pray whenever we come to God and whenever we come to his word. So, Let's read this Galatians 5 passage as a way of testing whether or not we, the deeds that are coming from us and the attitudes in the heart of what is in us is reflecting Christ or whether it's reflecting the compromises and the patterns of the culture of, of the world around us. Now the deeds of the flesh are evident, which are immorality, impurity, sensuality, idolatry, sorcery, enmities, strife, jealousy, outbursts of anger, these uh, disputes, dissensions, factions, envying, drunkenness, carousing, and things like these of which I forewarn you, just as I have forewarned you, that those who practice such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, Kindness, gentleness, goodness, faithfulness, self-control. Against such things there is no law. Now those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified the flesh and its passions and desires. If we live by the Spirit, let us also walk by the Spirit. If we live by the Spirit, which we do, let us walk by the Spirit. And if we walk by the Spirit and live by the Spirit, then good deeds will flow from us and we'll be ready and willing to seize opportunities to do good. And that will fill the needs of the people around us. Set in order what remains, Paul told Titus. Glenn, church of Grand Prairie, set in order what remains. Rebuild your foundations if you have to. Let the furnace drive the dross to the surface of your life and let God purify your hearts. Permit me one more remains verse. It's found in Revelation chapter 3 as he writes to one of the churches. To the angel of the church of Sardis, right? He who has the seven spirits of God and the seven stars says this, I know your deeds, that you have a name and that you are alive, but you are dead. Wake up and strengthen the thing that remains, which we were which were about to die, for I have not found your deeds completed in the sight of my God. God is going to allow us to stay here until by his grace we fulfill everything that he's called us to do. And he will give us the strength to do it. I'm not afraid of 2021. I believe that God is going to strengthen that which remains and he is going to glorify his name through our lives. Let's bow and pray. 
Heavenly Father, I thank you for purifying us through the work of Jesus. I thank you for calling us to yourself. I thank you for birthing the observable spirit-filled life in us to your glory for the hope and the help of our friends and family and our community around us. Father, I ask you today to strengthen what remains in us that is of you. You must increase and we must decrease. Set in order in us. Set in order in us. Prepare us for what is yet to come. That we might be faithful. That we might be strong in you. And we thank you today that we are part of a kingdom that cannot be shaken. Lord, I thank you that you have made us a part of what you're doing and that you love us and that uh, you are going to act strongly on behalf of those who are your people in this year. I thank you for it in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless you.